Shall we begin? When you think of the great classic 90s black TV shows, what usually comes to mind are the usual suspects like Martin, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Family Matters, and The Cosby Show. It was an era where we were introduced to iconic American treasures such as the Thighmaster and Taco Bell's catchiest catchphrase to date. Yo quiero Taco Bell. Pizza Hut was actually good. Payphones were everywhere. And Clueless set off a wave of young millennials who idolized Cher and Dion in both style and catchy slang. Oh, it was truly a special time to be alive. I did not have sexual relations with that one. Teen magazines were all the rave, and technology was taken off as the World Wide Web entered our lives. Welcome. You've got mail. You went nowhere without your Sony Walkman or Discman, and Blockbuster hit movies kept us at the movie theaters. Gosh, remember Friday nights at Blockbuster Video? But as it turns out, it was the golden era for TV shows and made-for-TV movies. After all, who could forget lazy Saturdays and Sundays parked in front of the two for hours on end, binge-watching Saturday morning cartoons, Teen Summit, Video Soul, and Caribbean Rhythms, capped off by some of the era's best Lifetime movies. More on that in a later video. But in this video, we're taking a nostalgic trip down memory lane to take a look back at some of the sitcoms that have largely been forgotten by many of us. The 90s was a special time in TV broadcasting, particularly for black audiences. There were many critically acclaimed shows which were only greenlit for one season. A few managed to squeak out two or more seasons by switching networks or by changing air schedules to ride the viewership wave of other highly rated shows. These shows were important for the culture at large because many of them offered a rare glimpse into the lives of those in the black culture. So let's take a look back at the best top 10 best forgotten 90s TV shows, which are in no particular order. But before we get started, please don't forget to hit that like button and share this nostalgic 90s goodness. Now, first up coming in at number 10, we have the Kid and Play cartoon. The Kid and Play cartoon was a 1990 animated cartoon series based on the real life hip hop duo Kid and Play. The episodes contain positive messages for kids along with the humor. It ran for one season on NBC from September 8th through December 8th, 1990. Not nearly long enough because it was one of my favorite Saturday morning cartoons and most of the kids I knew. On the show, Kid and Play were portrayed as teenagers, but their recording careers remained the same as in real life, as did their character traits. So what we saw was similar to what was in the house party films. Play was the free-spirited member of the group, cooking up get-rich-quick schemes, while Kid was the more level-headed member, usually the one there to clean up the mess. The real Kid and Play appeared live in between segments on the show, but the voiceover actors took over for the animated versions of the duo. The show stressed positive role models, teaching children how to get along with each other and staying out of trouble. Oftentimes, the issue would be resolved by the character's girlfriends or by an elderly jazz musician who wore a blue beret named Old Blue. The lessons ranged from serious to the lighter fare. One of the less serious episodes dealt with Kid's father under the impression that hip hop was bad and that Kid did not have the means to put it in a positive light. Old Blue offers help to Kid by sending him on a trip back in time to the jazz era of the 1920s where speakeasies were popular and in order to help him better understand its roots. Marvel Comics published a tie-in comic book which ran for nine issues in 1992. And also, Kid and Play's 1989 hit, Rollin' with Kid and Play, was used as the theme song for the series. And as of the production of this video, the series can actually be found on YouTube, guys. My kids saw it and quickly fell in love with it. You know, we really were sad that there were only a few episodes, you know, but this show overall was li largely unpopular with white audiences, but it was quickly canceled. Coming up next at number nine, we have The Gregory Hines Show. 
The Gregory Hines Show premiered on CBS on Monday, September 15, 1997. Unlike many of its counterparts, The Gregory Hines Show was more mature in its themes. The CBS head at the time decided to include the show in part of its popular Friday Night Block Party, which was the competitor to ABC's TGIF. It was an effort to target the whole family. What would seem at first thought to be a risky move, sticking Gregory Hines, master tap dancer and Broadway star in a family sitcom, ended up being a stroke of modest genius as the pilot was highly rated. Surprisingly, Gregory Hines was a natural fit for sitcom stardom, bringing effortless charisma and warmth to the show. The premise of the show follows the life of Ben Stevenson, played by Hines, who is a publishing agent and widower raising his 12-year-old son, Maddie, played by Brandon Hammond. The show picks up a year and a half after his wife's death when Ben decides to resume his social life and begin dating again. He soon realizes that he has a lot to relearn about women just as his son is learning about them for the first time. Surrounding Ben and Maddie were Ben's pushy brother, played by Wendell Pierce, lovable dad, played by Bill Cobbs, and some offbeat yet quirky co-workers. They brought the comedic flavoring up a notch and greatly contributed to the initial success of the series. What further distinguished Ben's office mates was the color of their skin. They were white in an overall, quote, black sitcom. This type of diversity combined with the lack of racial and cultural stereotypes was rare in primetime TV. Normally, the inclusion of white characters on a black sitcom meant the show was more likely to be successful. However, for The Gregory Hines Show, despite being highly rated, the series was still canceled. It aired on CBS on Friday nights in direct competition with extremely popular TGIF shows, Family Matters, and Step by Step. So sadly, it just did not stand a chance, y'all. It ended its run on February 27th, 1998, with 15 episodes aired out of the 22 that were produced. Fun fact, Brandon Hammond, Gregory Hines, and Wendell Pierce all played in the 1995 blockbuster hit, Waiting to Exhale, one of my favorite movies. Oh my God, I love that one. Next up at number eight is Arsenio. Now here is one I definitely forgot, y'all. Three years after the Arsenio Hall show went off the air in 1994, Arsenio Hall started his own sitcom in 1997. Arsenio, it was titled, aired on ABC for just a short while. It aired from March 5th through April 23rd, 1997, with only a total of seven episodes produced. So yeah, you may have forgot about this one too. Set in Atlanta, Georgia, the series starred Arsenio Hall as Michael Atwood, the host of a sports news TV show, and alongside him was his new wife, Vivian, an attorney played by 90s beauty Vivica A. Fox. The story was centered primarily on the comedy and drama in Michael's life on the job and at home, where Vivian's younger brother and slacker Harvard graduate, played by Eleni Ballard, lived with them. Despite looking promising, the show was canceled rather quickly with ABC citing low ratings for the reason for the show's untimely demise. Coming in at number seven is Me and the Boys. Now we all remember the unforgettable Steve Harvey show which premiered on UPN in 1996 where he played our favorite high school music teacher, Mr. Hightower, alongside Serge the Entertainer, Romeo, Bullethead, Principal Regina Greer, and of course, La Vida Alize Jenkins. But few of us probably remember Steve Harvey in his very first sitcom. Me and the Boys premiered on ABC on September 20th, 1994. The series featured a then upcoming comedian Steve Harvey, who also served as a show writer in his first starring role. Harvey stars as Steve Tower. See what they did there? Steve Tower, a widower who ran a video store in Dallas and was struggling with raising three boys on his own. At the time, the show was one of many 90s shows whose themes focused on widowed males raising children and the adventures that were sure to follow. Coming to America actress Madge Sinclair co-starred as Steve Tower's mother-in-law, Mary, while Chaz Lamar Shepard, 
Wayne Collins Jr., and Benjamin LaVert played the sons of Steve Harvey's character. The series was scheduled on Tuesdays in the time slot directly following Full House and directly before Home Improvement. I think the whole single dad raising kids on their own kind of theme was kind of overdone, and this might have been too much for viewers as it was yet another similarly themed show, and for that, the series struggled despite being sandwiched in between two uber successful white sitcoms. Despite ranking number 20 in the ratings, ABC canceled the series after only one season. The show last aired on February 28th, 1995. Next up, we have number six, George. George premiered on the ABC network November 5th, 1993. The series followed boxing legend George Foreman, who played an ex-boxer that ran a youth center for troubled kids. Many boxing fans wondered if Foreman could actually act. After the pilot aired, critics hit out, stating that Foreman's performance reminded viewers that he was still more of a boxer than an actor. But it kind of still worked, even if for a little while. With this series, ABC tried to capture his appeal as a personality an overweight 40-something ex-champ who returns to the ring and fought with tremendous courage. The public's respect for that comeback, coupled with Foreman's likability and his ability to joke about himself, made him a hit in 90s TV commercials. Despite that, it was not enough to keep the series afloat, with George being canceled after airing nine episodes. The series last aired on January 19, 1994. Fun fact, legendary actor Tony Danza, who started Who's the Boss, is one of the executive producers on George. Number five, Here and Now. Here and Now premiered on the NBC network on September 19th, 1992. The series starred Malcolm Jamal Warner in the lead role, who prior to this series co-starred in The Cosby Show, which ended its eight year run six months earlier in April 92. Bill Cosby served as one of the show's executive producers along with Warner serving as the executive consultant on the show. The show was kind of sort of a gift for Bill Cosby to Malcolm Jamal Warner. That was very nice of him. Well, Here and Now was, uh, you know, another commitment that Mr. Cosby had uh, at NBC, and he wanted, you know, we were, they, there was talk about doing a spinoff with Theo. We both kind of felt like we didn't want to do a spinoff. I didn't want to play, keep playing Theo. Um, so you know, we came up with this idea with the show, with this, you know, this guy who goes to uh, Columbia working with his, uh, his master's in psychology, which is what Ennis was doing. Works part time uh, uptown in this community center. Granted, it wasn't Theo, but you know, Theo was majoring in psychology. Theo worked at a community center. <laughs> so it was basically Theo by a different name. Uh, that was a show where uh, that did not have full support from the network. I think the network thought that doing a show about a, com you know, a community center you know, with young kids was not going to be funny. It turned out that people loved the show. When the pilot tested, you know, everybody loved the show. It became the number two rated pilot. Too much to our dismay, they put Here and Now on Saturday night, which obviously hurt the performance of the show because my audience is not home. My audience still isn't home on Saturday night at 8 o'clock trying to watch television. While working at the center, he lived with Sydney, played by Charles Brown, who also was his non-biological uncle. I guess it's play uncle, I guess. The series' co-stars included S. and Patha Merkerson as the head of the youth center, and Daryl Chill Mitchell as T, a former delinquent now working at the center. I hated to see this one in, y'all. It had all the ingredients for success, However, the show last aired on January 2nd, 1993. I think I was in third grade then. Yeah, that was third grade. Hmm. All right, y'all, number four, we have Buddies. Buddies aired on ABC from, eight, from March 5th through April 3rd, 1996, just shy of one month. But what made this extremely short-lived series memorable was that it launched the mainstream career of a then widely unknown Dave Chappelle. 
The show was born out of comedians Dave Chappelle's and Jim Brewer's guest appearance on the 1995 episode of ABC's highly rated sitcom Home Improvement. The episode's storyline featured Chappelle and Brewer as two friends who appear together on Tool Time to ask Tim Taylor for advice on their love lives. The character's single outing on the episode was so popular that ABC decided to give Chappelle and Brewer their own half-hour sitcom. But after many rehearsals, Jim Brewer was replaced with Christopher Garden as Dave Chappelle's quote, buddy, and this proved to be extremely problematic for the future of the series. The unique comic timing and chemistry that Chappelle had with Brewer, his real life friend, was just not present with Garden and Brewer's abrupt firing exacerbated ill will on Chappelle's end. This prevented Dave Chappelle and Garden from developing the rapport and the chemistry necessary for the character's believability and likability. As a result, the show had disappointing ratings. Dave Chappelle himself was not proud of his involvement with Buddies in retrospect. Buddies aired only five episodes out of the 13 that were produced. Mm, mm, mm. Coming in at number three, we have Out All Night. Out All Night premiered on NBC on September 19th, 1992, and it ran for one season. The show's premise centers on the life of Chelsea Page, singer Patti LaBelle, who runs an LA nightclub and young graduate, played by Morris Chestnut, and his irresponsible best friend and roommate, played by Dwayne Martin. They all help Chelsea and her daughter, Sharice, played by actress Vivica A. Fox, run the nightclub. This show had all the bones for a successful sitcom. Everyone brought their A-game, it was funny, and Patty was a force on the screen. We first got to know her on A Different World when she played Dwayne Wayne's mother, and this role seems to be an extension of that character. Not sure what went wrong with this one though, y'all, because I, I definitely watched it. But I can I guess it was likely for the ma for the reason that we see all these shows in, which was that it just was not a hit with the mainstream audiences. And ABC ended up canceling the show. It last aired on July 9th, 1993. Coming up at number two, we have Rock. On August 25th, 1991, Rock premiered on Fox. The series starred Charles S. Dutton as Baltimore garbage collector Rock Emerson, who constantly brought home perks, collecting various items thrown away by residents on his route, and Ella Joyce as his wife Eleanor, who was a registered nurse. Rounding out the supporting cast was his younger brother Joey, played by actor Rocky Carroll, a struggling musician who recently returned to the neighborhood, and his father, a retired Pullman porter, Andrew, played by legendary actor Carl Gordon. After a successful live episode was broadcast in February 92, the producers and the Fox Network agreed to air each episode of the second season as a live performance. While fans were devoted, their numbers were also low. For three seasons, Rock was acclaimed critically, but was generally toward the bottom of Nielsen ratings, though it did quite well in black households. After it was announced that the series had been canceled after three seasons, petitions circulated to get Rock back on the air. Fox said it made the decision based on the fact that in its final season, Rock ranked 117th out of 124 TV shows. Prior to being canceled, the network tried moving Rock from Sunday to Tuesday and packaging it with the popular show Martin and even brought in a new character played by teenage actress Alexis Fields. In a statement about the cancellation, Fox Entertainment president at the time, Sandy Grusho, said that while he liked and respected the show, the network could no longer wait for the series to find the mainstream audience it needed to survive. In response, Charles S. Dutton had an interesting yet controversial insight. He accused Fox of washing his hands of the show long ago. He said the network never promoted Rock the way it did other shows such as Melrose Place and Married with Children. Grusho replied, stating that Dunn's accusations were without merit. Dunn, however, disagreed, stating, I just find it interesting that a show Fox always said couldn't find an audience was never showcased in order to gain one. 
Dutton also added that Fox began to lose interest after the show started to get the reputation of being a, quote, racist show. Dutton described his relationships with Fox as strained, stating that tensions developed because his insistence that he rewrite episodes, which the storylines were particularly centered around race. For an example, in one episode, Brother Joey decides to date a white woman. Dutton said, they said it was too one-sided. TV always wants black characters to say, oh, we are the world, let's all live together. But Dutton says, that just wasn't realistic. I know a lot of black people who have a problem with it. Hell no, to the no, no, no. Hell to the no. That was only one of the many run-ins that Dutton had with the show's mostly white writers, who he called insensitive to black experiences. They always wanted us to be more funny, he said. Be more funny. That's in my frustration with Fox, said Dutton. Interesting though, was that at the time, Fox was viewed as the network that actually sought after urban or black audiences, airing many of the classics like In Living Color, Martin, Living Single, and New York Undercover. The cancellation of Rock and South Central would remain at the crux of debate about the nature of black programming and how to handle emotionally sensitive race issues. TV had routinely used humor as a way of relieving social tension and anxieties to make white audiences more comfortable with black people on shows such as The Jeffersons and Good Times. So what this basically meant was that the more exaggerated and ridiculous the characters, such as Martin Lawrence on Martin, or Jaleel White as Urkel on Family Matters, or the more pristine and colorless like The Cosby Show, the more comfortable the mass audiences would be with the black show. So by making Rock or South Central more comedic, it made addressing problems of the inner city a constant source of tension for both black and white audiences funny, therefore, easier to consume. But sadly, in the entertainment industry, because popularity determines profitability and profitability determines success, black shows that confronted viewers with deeper, more challenging messages would continue to struggle. And it would be an issue that this show just could not overcome and the last episode aired on May 10th, 1994. And coming up at number one is South Central. South Central premiered on the Fox Network on April 5th, 1994. It was set in 90s South Central LA and dealt with the lives of the Mosley family and covered hard-hitting issues such as gang violence, drugs, dating, sex, school, and unemployment. The series, which was produced on a smaller budget than most sitcoms, was popular among critics for what was perceived as a realistic and sometimes dark portrayal of urban life. Joan Mosley, played by actress Tina Lifford, is a divorced mother of four, raising three children, Andre, played by Lorenz Tate, Tasha, played by Tasha Scott, and foster son Dion Carter, played by Keith Mbulo, after her oldest son Marcus was murdered years earlier in a gang beef. Joan's financial situation becomes complicated after she is laid off. The show aired on Tuesday evenings following Rock. Due to the decline of ratings of the entire night of programming, Fox canceled all of the shows that aired on that night, which included The Sinbad Show and A Living Color. The cancellation of the series, all of which had predominantly black cast, prompted Jesse Jackson to call for a boycott of the network for an alleged institutional racism. Fox maintained that all cancellations were due to low race and insisted race was not a factor. During a short run, South Central featured many guest stars, including Jennifer Lopez, Char Jackson, and Maia Campbell. It was canceled though after its first season, after 10 episodes aired and last aired on June 7th, 1994. So guys, do we forget any? If we did, let us know in the comment section below as I would just love to hear what you guys have fond memories of from back in the day. And also, stay tuned for part two of this series because upon digging and researching, I found so many more memorable throwbacks that I just have to bring to you. You know, it's hard to pay this era the homage that it's due and only stick to 10. It's just impossible, but I will keep them in 
segments of 10 so that it makes it a little bit shorter. Yeah, so, you know, as always, please do not forget to leave a like as we embark on a new path here on this channel. And also, please, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you have your notifications turned on as well because we will continue cutting up for the culture and bringing you the best of the best of the 80s and 90s, easily the best decades to be a kid. All right, guys, take care. Thank you for watching, and I will catch you in the next video. Bye.